Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Peter Edson, waving hello from America. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I'm with you in spirit. And thank you for welcoming me into your conference this morning. So what did we just see? The first video was from the first ever Marshmallow concert in Fortnite, held in February 2019. 10 million people attended this concert. And if you're like me, you had no idea this even happened. Fortnite has about two or 300 million active users. And for many people, it is their hangout, their social media, their community, an integral part of their social life. And I would say quite obviously of their culture. There are no opera houses, museums, or archives about this culture that I know of yet. But we know that not everything that is culture has an institution devoted to it. The second video was of Jibo, a robot designed specifically to be social. It was not a successful commercial product, but it nonetheless had a profound effect on people. In testing and focus groups, participants often refused to leave their sessions before they had personally said goodbye to Jibo. People feel empathy for a wide variety of entities. If Jibo moves us and we care for it, and it creates even on some basic level, is it part of our culture? Might the Jibos of the world collectively have a culture? The last video was a dance routine performed by Spot, a utility robot designed by Boston Dynamics. Spot is designed to do things like carry bricks and run errands on construction sites. Dirty, dangerous, tedious work. But Spot can also dance, move with beautiful dexterity. The creators of this video were quick to point out that Spot didn't improvise these moves and that the video took over 40 takes to produce. But I would add that this is frequently the case for human performers as well. I recently saw the Marinsky Ballet in St. Petersburg, Russia. Those dancers don't choreograph their own moves, and many of them have trained 10 or 20 years, more or less nonstop, to have the privilege of performing on that stage. I have no doubt that before we know it, Spot and his friends will be choreographing their own work. Will we allow ourselves to think of that as culture? Will these performances be part of our collective cultural heritage? But I skipped a video. Right before Uptown Spot was a piano performance by researcher Chris Howard. The first piece he played you may have recognized as a Bach prelude, but the second piece he played was composed by an algorithm. Most people can't tell the difference. In one experiment held over 20 years ago, composer Steve Larson challenged computer programmer David Cope to a contest. A pianist would play pieces by Larson, Bach, and one of David Cope's computers before a live audience, and the audience would vote on who they thought composed which piece. Quote, Larson was convinced that most people would easily distinguish between soulful human compositions and the lifeless artifacts of a machine, wrote one reviewer. In fact, at the end of the performance, when the artist audience voted, they thought that the computer's piece was genuine Bach, that Bach's piece was composed by Steve Larson, and that Larson's piece was composed by a computer. Audiences, I'm told, become sullen and angry when they find out that the music that moved them spiritually was composed by a machine. Now, why did I show you this? Why did I take your time with this here on the second morning of your Europeana annual general meeting? I did it for a couple of reasons. The first was to make a point about culture and institutions, to create a vivid reminder that culture is so much broader, bigger, deeper, and more dynamic than we account for in our daily work. Our institutions are amazing, but the world is more amazing still. To those 10 million people who attended the Marshmallow Fortnite concert in February, it was their culture and it was real. So if we're really serving the needs, the cultural needs of Europeans, and perhaps of everyone everywhere, 
we need to think more broadly about what culture really means. The second is to make a point about technology and change. As crazy as the, as the world is right now, particularly concerning the dark side of platforms, privacy, and social media, my own subjective studies and intuition tell me that we're in the proverbial calm before the storm. It's likely to get weirder and weirder in ways that we really can't anticipate before things calm down again, if they ever do. And if you factor in a wild card like AI, robotics, material science, nanotechnology, quantum computing, biomedical engineering, well, then all bets are really off. Dancing robots that love you and computers composing music that moves your soul are the harbingers of a culture that is lived now, moving forward and into the future, not the culture that we see and think about in a rear view mirror. So we're going to need to spend more time collectively looking at now and looking towards the future than we're used to doing. The third is to make a point about speed. I think the speed and scale of change today, dancing robots, robots that love you, AI compositions, not to mention phenomenon like globalization, climate change. These are really testing the limits of our cultural capacity to understand what is happening to us and to take collective action when necessary, fast enough to make a difference. The old ways of working slowly and deliberately still matter, but they don't matter at all in some of the most critical challenges we face. And this is new. In the words of environmental activist Alex Steffen, when it comes to climate change, winning slowly is the same as losing. And in particular, regarding climate change, there is no doubt that we must win. That and much else will require an acute attentiveness to speed and to the civic actors, the cultural forces, mostly young now and young at heart, who have a different set of expectations, a different sense of speed, and a different sense of the consequences of slow, careful, deliberate progress, the ways of yesterday. And finally, hidden in these fun little videos is an implicit message about networks, capacity, and resilience. A few years ago, when we were just beginning to form our vision for the Museum for the United Nations, we knew that the problems we were tackling, extreme poverty, displaced people and refugees, gender equality, the climate emergency, these problems are so vast and so difficult that we could never make progress alone with top-down control. We knew we needed to be part of a network, but we struggled, quite frankly, to put words around that. What should it be? What even is a network? How does one work? How does it help? As soon as we started asking these questions, something really striking became apparent. Everyone we talked to, from the largest, most successful institutions to the smallest one or two person community organizations, everyone who was working on a difficult challenge at any scale felt that they wanted, they needed a strong network. But everyone felt that they were working in isolation, in silos. Everyone wanted to do more, but for the most part, nobody really knew how. One guy who ran a neighborhood development uh, NGO in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, stood on his local plaza and told me, the people on this side of the square don't know how to talk to the people on that side of the square. The people on this square don't know how to talk to the people one square over, and so on. Climate action NGOs in the Netherlands and elsewhere tell me they know how to talk to other NGOs and experts and government, but they don't know how to talk to so-called normal people. In Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, people told me that normal people never see and talk to the people who work for the UN. At UN headquarters, they told me they never see and talk 
to normal people anywhere. And that's a pity, because a lot is actually known about the science of how networks work, how to measure their strength, their resilience, their characteristics, and what steps can be taken to nurture and improve them over time. Quantitatively, we know that a network like this will be more powerful, more capable of innovating, of sustaining effort, of sensing, reacting to, and anticipating opportunities and change than a disconnected and disjointed network like this. We've known this in business, I think, for 20 years. We know how to connect these nodes and create a stronger and more resilient and higher performing network. But very few organizations, it seems, are motivated, dedicated to, and focused on nurturing these connections. So I think when we look back, hopefully 50 or 100 years from now, and ask ourselves, what was it that made the difference? <laughs> How did we survive? It's likely we'll say that it wasn't the servers, the collections, the buildings, the exhibitions, or the public programs. Or rather, we'll say that those things mattered, among many others, but as a means to an end, which was to create and strengthen the network, the connections between people, so that the world, as it is, could be understood, and the know-how and imagination and vitality of millions and billions of people could be connected and could flourish. So, to overcome the challenges we face and build a strong, resilient future so that we can enjoy our talking, choreographing, classical music, composing, global online festival, convening robotic dogs, among other things, we're going to have to think more broadly about what culture is, who owns it, who it's for. We're going to need to work fast and we're going to need each other more than we ever have before. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your conference.